So the, no, the thing that you have to grasp from the genetic stuff is that basically in your body, this only applies to T cells and B cells, because I said in innate cells, they have, let's say, 100 receptors on each of the innate cells, but they're the same. All innate cells are exactly the same. All the neutrophils are exactly the same. So in B cells and T cells, they're very, very specific. So on any one B cell, any one T cell, they only have one type of antigen receptor, but overall, with all the millions and billions of, um, of T or B cells, in total, they have the specificity to attach to literally any pathogen. Okay? <coughs> and he said that, you know, he said that if something comes from space, right, our body will be able to mount an immune response towards it. That's true, but that's assuming that the alien is a carbon-based life form. If it's not, then we're fucked. Quite literally, yeah. <laughs> it's like nitrogen basis. I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, so you have 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 13 or something like that amounts of different types of antigen receptors for B and T cells. And the way it's done is there's three processes. Combinatorial diversity, which is the one that he described. Did everyone understand his balls thing? So, did you say not really or yeah? That's good, okay. That's an oversimplification, but it's perfect for you guys, okay? So what, <laughs> what that literally means is if this is a gene, right, the receptor, let's say the B cell, the variable of Shadlir, oh yeah, got rid of the um, <laughs> Okay. Okay, right, so this is the variable region, this is the constant regions, okay? All constant regions here are roughly the same thing, okay? So what you have is you've got, you have a gene, this is one gene in your DNA, and it has four things, it has four sections to it, okay? It has the V section, gosh. Let's do, it, let's do it another way. Okay. Okay. Let's say that in this section, it's got these are just made up figures. This is for your understanding, because you don't, you never need to remember these numbers. Only like if you do it for BSD, then you do. Okay. Let's say it's got fifty here. It's got about ten. It's got four, and it's got about. There's nine here, isn't there? There's only nine constant regions. Okay? That's how you get those. Okay, all combinatorial diversity means is there's 50 of these, there's 10 of these, four of these, and there's nine of these. If you take this section of the V, you take this section of the D, you take this of the J, and you take let's say, the, the gamma section for IgG, okay, of the C, you take that, 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 you combine, you splice everything off, so you get rid of all the rest, that's all bollocks, you splice it all off until you end up with, let's call this V1, D1, J1, and C mu, uh, C gamma, sorry, okay, so you're left with V1, You've cut off all this stuff, you've literally just cut it straight off, so all of these things are right next to each other. V1, D1, J1, and C, um, gamma. Does that make sense? That's all it is. That's the combination. Because there's 50 of these, you can take any one, so you can do V1 with D2, with J1, and blah, blah, blah. So eventually you end up with like 10 to the 11 different combinations. That's all he was trying to say. Is that a little bit better? Does that make sense? Yeah? 
his, his thing wasn't that bad. It was pretty good, his balls thing. Um, but yeah, this is exactly the same thing. This is slightly easier, I think. That's combinatorial diversity, the combination of different genes. And then this thing will go on to get translated into this part, which forms a variable region. J is the junction, OK? And C then goes on to do the composite region. Simple, yeah? Really, really simple. That's combinatorial diversity. That is not the most important way of getting those mutations. That's the least important way. The next way is called junctional diversity. And he did talk about this, but he didn't mention this word. Okay, it's called junctional diversity. That means that when you're splicing this part off, you're cutting it off, right? You might leave like one or two amino acids on either end. And because of those amino acids, it actually gives rise to a slightly different shape. So you've heard of sticky, sticky ends and whatever, haven't you? When you cut stuff, so if you have an amino acid code and it's complementary, whatever it is, you can cut a straight end, you can cut a sticky end, that, that sort of stuff. Does that make sense? So the splicing, when you splice it, it's not always going to be a straight cut. And sometimes it depends on whatever happens. It can be a sticky end, it can cut anywhere in this combination between these areas. It can cut here, it can cut here, it can cut anywhere. So eventually you're left with that much of this, you're left with that much of that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? That's junctional diversity. When it forms together, it's going to form a slightly different shape. That is a big way. And he did, make, I, I'm sure he mentioned this in the lecture. He said that when it gets spliced, it can splice a little bit differently. Yeah? Okay, so that's, that's quite an important way. The most important way, oh, and by the way, this combinatorial diversity is called somatic recombination, right? That means that you're cutting all of that off and you're recombining it together. So the, the name of the type of diversity, the diversity is how all of those receptors are formed. That's combinatorial diversity. The process by which that happens is called somatic recombination. That's the actual process. Okay, that's the one he talks about. So I mentioned those two. The last one is called somatic hypermutation. And he even did kind of mention this. Do you remember the lecture of the germinal center and the B cell? Um, do you understand what he's talking about? Yeah. What that is, is basically an antibody, when it's formed, it has the ability by itself to become or a receptor, a T cell receptor, has the ability to become slightly more specific to a specific antigen. What I mean by that is if you have um, an antibody with, oh no, let's put a bit better, um, with a shape like this, okay, and your antigen looks a bit like this. This antibody then has the ability, by going back to the germinal centers, and you don't need to worry about the process, it has the ability to slightly change its shape by a somatic mutations, by a mutation, slightly change its shape to become more complementary towards the antigen. Okay? And by doing that, these small little changes, you're actually creating literally an infinite amount of antibodies, yeah? They're not all gonna be the same, they're gonna be slightly different. Make sense? That's the most important way. Somatic hypermutation is the most important way. That results in the greatest diversity because both of these ways, they're finite. Hypermutation, you can mutate any part, therefore it's pretty much infinite, okay? So those are the three main things. The one he and Andy talked about most is combinatorial diversity. The only way that they can ask you that is, um, in an SAQ where he says, describe how antigen um, diversity, sorry, antibody or antigen receptor diversity is formed, then you describe this process. Okay, for like some like three marks or something, I'm guessing. Okay, it's quite simple. Just say you've got loads and loads of different genes in each one of those. You get splicing of the ones that you don't want, so you randomly pick. It's a random process. You get to randomly pick whichever combination you want. Yeah, something like that. Okay, that's almost all the genetics. The last part of the genetics is polygenic polymorphic. 
Okay? That is shit. <laughs> oh. Sorry, give me a sec. <laughs> I don't want to be walking around white chapel like this, otherwise it's probably really quite get excited or something. <laughs> um, right, okay. Um, polygenic polymorphic with reference to MHC HLA. So, if you look at HLA molecules, we talked about there being two main types. There's one and there's two. I never, I didn't talk about one at all because that's in another lecture. That's in your cell-mediated immunity lecture. I said HLA-2 is presented on antigen-presenting cells in order for a CD40 cell to get activated, yeah? Therefore, if you think about it, HLA-1 is going to be presented on a cell for CD8 to get activated. That's what the difference is. For HLA-1, HLA-2... Within HLA-1, there's loads of different types. Um, I can't even remember them. It's like A, B, C, isn't it? D, Z, Q, Z, R, D, T. Bear with me for one sec. Yeah, okay. So HLA1, just as I said, is A, B, C. Okay? What I mean that by that is HLA1A, HLA1B, HLA1C. Make sense? <coughs> Usually you don't need to call it HLA1A, you just say HLA-A, HLA-B, HLA-C. Because you know it's one, because this is a different name. This is DP, DQ and dr okay that's on alpha beta only that's four alpha beta c cells okay so hla dp dq dr a b and c you must have read somewhere things like hla b20 have you heard of hla b27 that if you have that type of hla you you're pretty much predisposed to get one of like the spondyloarthritis so ankylosing spondylitis that sort of stuff Okay, that's a really important one, but it's probably not useful for you at the moment. HLA to that B. So as I said, B27. So within here, you have loads and loads of numbers, like one to a million or something. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm making that up. <laughs> so um, HLA A100, HLA B27. That's within your own body. You have so many different types of HLA1, so many different types of HLA2. That's what polygenic means. You have so many genes for HLA1, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? That's polygenic. You have different types of HLA1, HLA2. Okay. Polymorphic means you have different alleles from your parents. So let's say your parents have... Or a better way to do this is, let's say I have HLA-B1 to 5 and my wife has HLA 6 to 10, right? If me and her had a kid, my kid would get mine and hers, okay? Therefore, she, my, my kid would have 1 to 10. And all of them are expressed in the body, so it's codominant, and that's what polymorphism is. It's the ability that two sets of alleles from two different individuals then goes into the next of kin and they just have a lot more. Does that make sense? That's a real simplification. A polymorphism, remember the word codominance because you're expressing both sets of alleles at the same time. You're expressing the ones that your mom gave you and your dad. Therefore, in total, you have a lot. Yeah? Yeah, but the thing I didn't really mention is when you're doing gametogenesis, you're halving it anyway. So, does that make sense? Because you're halving, you're only giving half, and then every time you're only giving half and you sperm and your egg. Yeah? That's polygenic, that's polymorphism. 